What is up, DFS family, and welcome back to the Sunday School NFL DFS podcast powered by Fantasy Six Pack. I am your host, Pat Mikowski. You can find me on Twitter at PattyMac33. I am joined by my co-host, Mr. David Eddy, whom you can find on Twitter at Corporal Eddy. That's right, folks. David got spanked last week. And oddly enough, I think he actually enjoys it a little bit. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so first off, I'd like to apologize for the podcast being cut a little bit short last week. We experienced some technical difficulties. Hopefully, they'll work themselves out this week because you all missed the fact that I spot on nail my Hail Mary last week with DeAndre Swift to the tune of 30.3 points with a $4,500 price tag. Okay. I got that out of my system now. David, anything you'd like to say before we get started? No, it sucks that the Swift portion of it um, didn't make it because you most definitely said that. Um, I've got the notes to back it up, but sucks that you uh, that, that wasn't there. So what are you, what are you going to do, man? Technical difficulty got gotcha, you, man. Yep, yep. So real quick, please do us a favor and hit that like button. If you enjoyed this podcast, do yourself a favor Hit that subscribe button. If you want to keep a leg up on all your buddies, swing over to fantasysixpack.net to check out some more great content. And just a reminder, we are talking DraftKings Main Slate MME tournaments. Let's get the ball rolling, Davey. Who is your gospel this week? I am going to roll with the very underrated Robbie Anderson. 6K this week. Um, Panthers versus Saints comes in as the 17th most expensive wide receiver. And the reason, I mean, I, I wanted it to go a few different directions. Um, Kamara seemed like an obvious choice, but I mean, when I look at all the numbers for this week's main slate, he provides a tremendous value that is actually, uh, from what, what I'm seeing far surpassing everybody else. Uh, The offense in Carolina is very top-heavy. Only DJ Moore, Mike Davis, and Robbie Anderson himself get, you know, shares at a usable level. Over the past four weeks, that trio is the only ones on that team that has averaged more than three targets per game, with Anderson holding slightly more than two targets per game, more than uh, DJ Moore in that period of time. Now, in week six, DJ Moore, for the first time this season, actually out-targeted Anderson, and he did so at a two-to-one clip. So I think that people are going to start to gravitate back towards Moore over Anderson, even though I think it's fairly clear that Anderson is Bridgewater's uh, wide receiver one at this point. So I am probably not likely to have a lot of Panthers stacks. I, I'm almost certain if Michael Thomas is playing, um, to have some Bridgewater and Anderson and Thomas. And worst case scenario, I'll definitely have a, a Kamara uh, run back as well. But um, he's probably going to be, you know, on a secondary stack or, you know, even a little bit of one-off. But I think that his value this week is just tremendous at his 6K price tag. Yeah, I like Robbie Anderson in that offense a lot. I, I totally agree with you. Um, that I think he is Bridgewater's first choice uh, when it comes to to slinging the ball out there. Um, so, I, you know, slinging the ball out there, I'm sticking with the receiver as well. You kind of bummed me out a little bit when you hit me with some news that I was unaware of that, you know, this game is potentially being moved to the 8 o'clock Sunday night game. Uh, but there's rumors floating around that DraftKings is going to keep it on the main slate. So it remains to be seen. Um, but I'm going to roll with what I got, and that's DeAndre Hopkins as my gospel. Uh, Seahawks at the cards, arguably the best receiver in the game, going up against the worst secondary in the NFL. Seattle's given up almost 38 fantasy points a game to opposing wide receivers. Offenses are having to keep up with Big Russ and that Seahawks offense. Um, So, you know, 
opposing wideouts are getting nearly 32 targets a game and stacking up almost 300 yards a game against Seattle. Nuke is third in the NFL at over 10 targets a game. This has the potential to be an absolutely insane day for D-Hop. So I'm hoping they keep it on the main slate. I'm going to roll me out some DeAndre Hopkins. Um, yeah, they, I mean, they're definitely not going to be in the 1-4 o'clock range. Um, the game definitely moved to Sunday night. But, like I said, even though that has happened, the last thing that I saw is that that game is still going to be considered on the main slate, which is going to be good for a lot of people because that game's got a whole bunch of uh, directions to go into. Um, hey, who? Patrick, why don't you go ahead and lead in and to the next uh, topic for us, the, your devil for this week. Yeah, man. You know, my devil, I'm fading Ezekiel Elliott, 7,800 bones, the cowgirls at that football team. And let's just face it, anyone that sees it any differently is an absolute moron. Dak Prescott deserves every cent that he is asking for. This is his team. That offense moves through him very, very apparent last weekend as the Cowgirls got thumped by the Cardinals at Jerry's World, mind you. We saw firsthand why Cincinnati was okay with moving on from the Big Red Tomato. Because he sucks, Dave. He's terrible. Defenses can now key on Zeke, and that's exactly what they're going to do. Washington giving up about 96 yards a game and the ninth fewest fantasy points a game to opposing running backs at 16 spend this money somebody else put zeke on the bench this weekend washington is going to pull the upset at home and end up with a share of first place in the nfc least dave at a staggering two and five record horrible division i wouldn't play any cowboys at all anywhere until dallas figures this thing out at quarterback stay away from ezekiel elliott he's my devil how about you, Davey? What do you got? I'll tell you, here's what sucks. Which team is further east? The Detroit Lions or the Dallas Cowboys? Yes. The Detroit Lions are further <laughs> east on the compass, and they are in the NFC North. And the Dallas Cowboys are in the NFC East. The Lions could be a first-place team. Damn it, huh? Yeah. Son of yeah. a... Crazy. Crazy aye, world aye, aye. we're living in Fly, these days. Lions would be like a, a juggernaut in the NFC East. Yeah, they could be. So you um, had yourself a, an elite running back as your devil this week. And um, I will see your Ezekiel Elliott. And I will raise you a Derrick Henry. So, you know, the man himself, the, the matchup maker from last week and his 200 yards rushing um, what do you get? Two touchdowns and yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. Beast well, mode. yeah. Derrick Henry this week, 7,500, um, against the Steelers. If you couldn't tell by my tone of voice, I faded Derrick Henry last week. Now to be, <laughs> Hey, to be fair, that looked like a brilliant plan for about three quarters. Did it not? Yeah. And it then did. he, and then he had a, a 94 yard touchdown. Which uh, bent all of uh, us non-Henry owners over, and um, you know, put it where the sun don't shine, uh, and that sucked, Patrick. But guess what? Apparently, I didn't learn my lesson because here I am again, man. Listen, one of my DFS rules is volume trumps matchup. Now, in that case, Henry is at at all costs one of the best as far as volume is concerned. Now, he even comes in at a reasonable price tag this week. I mean, 7500 for, you know, an elite running back um, is not much at all. Now, with that being said, I kind of expect to be seeing, you know, a 23-20, you know-ish type game. And so for Henry to pay off, even at that price tag, you're looking at about 25 points. Now, that's not going to happen, uh, you know, first of all, without him getting into the end zone, which I admit is obviously entirely possible. Um, but I think that Henry's ceiling is pretty limited this week. Uh, and I don't expect him to get shut down by the Steelers, you know, at all. But I certainly don't expect him to have one of the better statistical weeks at the position. So, with all that being said, Derrick Henry, again, for me, is going to be a hard pass. 
Yeah, you know, I can I can see where you're coming from, Dave, but, you know, you go to what you said with, you know, the volume, and it, the guy's just, he's, he's too explosive for me to just totally pass on him. Uh, so, but I can see what you're saying. You know, he, he gets one big burst of a run, and, and that's what makes his week last week. So, uh, I'm feeling that, you know, and, you know, going into our next category, you know, I'm going to stick at that running back position again. That's kind of what we're theming out here. So my archangel, my pivot for the week um, is actually Latavius Murray, $4,800 Panthers at the saints. And, you know, I'm looking at it from this perspective, people are going to be absolutely blowing their load on Camara this week. And rightfully so, this is a great matchup. And that's why I'm pivoting to Murray. Seems kind of like an obvious pivot for me, but I'm going to just go ahead and roll with it. Latavius is getting 10 to 15 touches a game. That is always the game plan. He's a whopping $3,100 less than Camara. To save that kind of loot and stick it somewhere for another position of player that normally you wouldn't be able to reach for the potential of possibly 20 points if if murray gets in the end zone uh that's a no-brainer for me uh so i'll have just as much run with murray this week as i do camara uh how about yourself i see uh you're sticking kind of with that theme as well so well i i'll tell you that's a tough one because um i mean you're right the last four weeks um, Kamara has averaged 20, well, he's actually averaged 20 touches on the dot and Murray comes in at 12 and a half basically. Um, but I mean, my number one golden rule for DFS is as simple as it sounds and people will laugh at it. But if you look at, if you're doing 20 max, if you look at your lineups, I bet you that just about everyone violates this rule if they're not thinking about it and you know and you know Im- implementing it is rule number one Patrick play good players I don't necessarily think that Latavius Murray is a bad player but um, playing a backup running back to me is just asking for trouble if unless you know Kamara gets hurt I think you're kind of pissing away some money um, but that's just me and then you know to go to rule number two then Rule number two is volume over matchup. Who's going to get more touches? It's going to be Kamara. Um, so I don't know. I, I'm not saying you're crazy. I'm just saying those are the rules that I live by. You know. Okay, so you've got so you've got your <laughs> rules, and I've got you've got your you've got I your your rules. I've got my rules, Patrick, and you've got your wins. So. Pick which side of the coin you'd rather have, right? That's right. Yeah. I'm going to stick to my yeah, way, and so, you keep sticking to your way. Yeah, so, so fuck me, who's right? Your, who, <laughs> who's your archangel this week? I'm going Antonio Gibson, 5K. He uh, plays for, you know, that football team. I'm going up against those cowgirls. Now, this is a week where I think salary kind of makes things hard. Um, you know, even if just because, you know, the more popular, the more popular stacking options – um, are expensive this week as it should be. And so you're going to have to look to places to save some money. Uh, Gibson is a guy that I was actually considering as my gospel. I, I just don't trust him enough. Like I said, play good players. And Robbie Anderson is a better player than Antonio Gibson is. Um, Gibson has a better matchup, but volume, you know, speaks towards Robbie Anderson. But, you know, this Dallas defense just got shredded by a guy that I wasn't even sure was still alive, um, Kenyon Drake, last week. Now, Gibson's been good for about 50% of the snaps on this team this year. Uh, and if it'd be higher if he wasn't always playing from behind. Um, so that could change this week because, like you had said earlier, um, you know, you think Washington's going to win this game, and I'll be honest with you, so do I. So, um, you know, I think that we could see an increase in touches uh, for him. Now, the past four weeks, he's been averaging a pretty reasonable 14 and a half per game. And I think that there's a pretty good chance that we'll see 20 against America's team this week. So um, now, interestingly enough, he's also second on the team in targets. Um, over the past four games, he has seen eight targets, eight targets, 
in six targets just in the last three of those games. So a guy that's going to get carries, solid share of targets from the running back position against a horrible defense at only 5K. Patrick, sign me up. I like it. I like it. That's a, that's a nice little play there. Um, the kid's good. <laughs> He's solid. Um, and like you said, you know, Kenyon Drake has been non-existent this year. And he absolutely torched them yeah. last week. So yeah. I just don't trust Gibson, so I can't see myself sticking seventy percent of him into my lineups. But um, I, I think he's in a really good position. You know, he's going to get the volume. Five ah, I, I, K is is the tipping point for me. You know, that that just makes it a, yeah. a no brainer. Yeah, that's good stuff, <laughs> man. You know, and the targets. You know, second in targets. Yep. Yeah, that's uh, that's really solid coming out of that backfield. So let's uh, let's get to our heresy, our contrarian for the week, and let's talk about a couple guys that uh, are throwing those running backs the ball out of that backfield. Yeah, so I'll go ahead and start off here with um, with my man Justin Herbert, sixty four hundred dollars uh, for the Chargers against the the beaten by the Lions Jag. So you know they fucking suck. Um, <laughs> Justin Herbert comes in as the 10th most expensive QB this week, which may not sound like a lot, but I think that it's probably a bit higher than people are looking to spend on a rookie quarterback this week whenever pretty much every single elite quarterback is available on the main slate this week, especially if we don't lose Murray and Russ, which I don't think we're going to. I just think that makes it that much less likely that even in a good matchup, people are going to look Herbert's way. Uh, now, this game also has an over-under that is under 50 points. There is, I have top of my head, I'm going to say four, five, maybe six games that are over 50 points. So again, no one's going to you know accidentally run into him because they're looking at over-unders, which is a pretty popular tactic when people are looking at building stacks. So uh, you know, another reason, again, people are not going to be looking at Herbert. Now, I think that you can build a very nice game stack that isn't going to be super popular um, if you take Herbert and then you know stack him with two of either Allen Williams or Henry and then run that back with either Shark or Chenault that's going to leave you with a nice amount of coin to spend filling out the rest of that roster and if and when that hits then you know you're you're looking to be in a pretty good spot and, and that could be the kind of stack Um, just with its potential, uh, with its ownership, and with its ceiling, that could bink you a tournament. Yeah. um, Yeah, I I agree. And Herbert's got a gun, man. He's, he, he may, he may turn out to be the best quarterback in that draft. I'm not sure yet. It's pretty early. uh, But I really, really like what the kids got going on. We're about to see Tua next week. Right, right, and that'll be uh, that'll be interesting. So, uh, you know, for my contrarian, my heresy this week, I'm going to stick at the QB position as mentioned, and I'm going with Ryan Tannehill, sixty two hundred bucks. Steelers at the Titans. You know, he's going up against the Steelers defense that only is yielding eighteen fantasy points a game to opposing quarterbacks. Um, Pitt has been absolutely outstanding against running backs and tight ends this year, but have struggled a little bit against wide receivers, yielding the fifth worst fantasy points a game to wide outs at almost 26 a game. Tannehill has been nothing short of terrific again this season, scoring over 25 fantasy points a game while throwing 13 TDs and only two interceptions and over 270 a game this year. Uh, he's got some really, really solid options at wide receiver, and he knows how to feed these guys the ball. And he gets Corey Davis back this week. Only 4,800 bucks for Corey Davis, by the way, for the first time since week number three. Sneaky little play here. Ryan Tannehill, in my opinion, is going to have a really, really good game against that tough Pittsburgh defense i'll tell you what patrick if you want to put um 
that little segment together, you can make yourself a nice little game stack and a nice little secondary game stack that isn't going to cost you the bank. How about this? Put Herbert at quarterback, match him with either Williams or Allen, put Henry in at the tight end spot, Go ahead and match it up with Jark or Chenault. Take your pick, right? There's your there's your game stack. Now your secondary yep. stack, you can go ahead and target that game, right? Go ahead and throw in A.J. Brown. If you really want to save money, go ahead and throw in Corey Davis. And then you run that son of a bitch back with Chase Claypool. There's the majority of your lineup. You got however much Hall money. Hall of Famer. You, Hall of Famer Chase Claypool. Yeah, Hall of Famer Chase Claypool, man. Um, you know, if you really want to save you know, even more money, I guess. Not that you necessarily need to at that point, but you know, you throw you throw Swift in there, you throw Antonio Gibson in there, have your pick of running backs, and then fill it out with the defense. And that is how you build an MME lineup, my friend. Yeah, that's a that's a nice one. That's a nice little sneaky one that you're not gonna get a lot of people that are running the same running the same show that you got going on yeah, there. It's so. got it has got a ceiling to it and it is fairly unique i would say i if i had my DraftKings app open i'd kind of put that together real quick and just see what that leaves you at the running back and at the defensive position there but either way moving on moving on so you know we're talked about a couple quarterbacks we started you know we got some running backs in here we started with some receivers so so let's go to our hail mary david who do you got that you're throwing your hail mary to this week well, um, I'll tell you what, man, how the mighty have fallen. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and chalk up here A.J. Green at a at a paltry $4,300 as the Bengals take on the Browns. Now, let me start off here by saying that I was so close, so close to putting Joseph Reginald Burrow in as my contrarian or pivot play, but I, I just did not. So listen, I do like a Bengals stack against the Browns this week. And when it comes to green, like I said, one time elite wide receiver in the game, what, two years ago? Um, just been an absolute shell of himself until last week, Patrick, when he came right back to life in the slot for the Bengals, had 11 targets, nearly 100 yards receiving. I think he goes pretty well under own in MME this week. He's in a prime position to pay off with his, like I said, measly salary there. 13 points from Green would equate our magical 3x that we're looking for. I think he provides you with an amazing value this week, which, as I've said, if you're going to be looking at the top stacks, you're going to need to save some money. If you go ahead and put him in there as a one-off, put Gibson in there as a one-off, you can play any of the major stacking options you want this week and still provide yourself with the ceiling that you need to win. Yeah, he uh, he definitely showed up last week. Um, you know, may, maybe, I mean, it, it's just taken him a, a handful of weeks to, to get back in the swing of things after being out for so long, get up to that game speed. Um, yeah, that's a nice little play to save yourself some loot. Uh, at that wide receiver position. Yeah, and I'm I'm actually looking up right now to see so, what his um, target share is for the season. Let me take a quick peek here. Oh, let's see. Well, snap count, he has been basically riding about 75%, which ain't too bad. He's at about six targets a game, which is unfortunately behind Higgins and Boyd, which are at eight and nine. And his target share is at pretty much, he's actually a higher target share than Higgins. So, um, Higgins is at 16%, Green's at 19 and Boyd's only at 20 So he's getting his share of targets. Um, he just actually made them pay off last week. So checking out those numbers for the first time, which I probably should have done ahead of time, but um, checking those out make me like A.J. Green a little bit more. Not that he's going to be a big play this week, but I still think that that's kind of a Hail Mary um, because I'm pretty sure he's going to be under 5% owned. Yeah, uh, I I think that that's uh, pretty reasonable. So uh, for me, I'm I'm sticking at that wide receiver position, and uh, Tim Patrick. I really like his last name, by the way. Uh, Forty six hundred bucks. I think it sucks. <laughs> Chiefs at the Broncos. Timmy, 
has quietly become Drew Locke's favorite target in that offense, collecting seven to eight targets a game, surpassing the 100-yard receiving mark in each of the last two weeks, one of those with a score. For that price tag, I'm going to throw my Hail Mary this week to Timmy. Timmy! <clears throat> Denver is Timmy! Denny, Denver is going to be down early in this one and often, and that means volume for the opposing quarterback, which means targets for his favorite wide receiver. Timmy Patrick, 4600 bucks. You could definitely do worse at the wide receiver position for that amount of money. Uh, I'm going to roll Timmy out there. My only concern is if Noah Fant comes back, he's going to eat into your boy's targets. Um, that's the reason he's seen an uptick in targets. So, so long as Fant is out, um, I think, you know, I mean, Patrick is definitely the second um, target in that offense. Um, you know, it would help. I don't know if Gordon will be out again, but if he is, that would be a, a huge boost as well. But, but yeah, either way, I mean, that's a tough Chiefs defense um, so far this year as well, which is going to make him just extremely low-owned. But there is an upside there because Drew Locke loves to sling that ball around, man. Yeah, and that's you know you know with the hail mary you go you go with something that something that's is not out pretty. of the norm, something that that would you fit know? right on this podcast as a host because it's not pretty. Yeah, uh, a co-host. Now we oh, mentioned right. several times. I, I apologize. How beautiful I am. Yeah, very handsome. Um, very handsome. Yep. Yep. So. Um, that's it. You got anything else to add for this week, Dave? I'm really, really anxious to see what's going to happen with that Seahawks Cardinals game. Um, I really hope that it, it stays on the main slate. Cause I think that that's going to be an absolute doozy for some points this week. So, yeah, I mean, you talk about the ultimate sweat, you're going to have to maybe wait until, you know, late, late, late Sunday night before scores are becoming final, because there's going to be some, like I said, some serious ownership, in that game. So, you know, you might be a, a millionaire at, you know, nine o'clock on a Sunday evening. And for the first time <laughs> you're going to lose your ass. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, all right, man. Well, if you got nothing else, I'm going to get back to it. Uh, ladies and gents, thank you so much for joining us once again. And uh, good luck this weekend. Go lions. <laughs>